today's passage comes from Psalms 119, verse 9 to 16. That's Psalms 119, verse 9 to 16. How can a young man keep his way pure by guarding it according to your word? With my whole heart I seek you. Let me not wander from your commandments. I have sought up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Blessed are you, O Lord. Teach me your statutes. With my lips I declare all the rules of your mouth. In the way of your testimonies I delight as much as in all riches. I will meditate on your precepts and fix my eyes on your ways. I will delight in your statutes. I will not forget your word. Let's pray. Our Father, we come before you to worship you. And one of the core um, experience of worship is to meditate on your word. So, Lord, we pray that you bless Pastor Corey to um, expound your word in a way that we can understand by the help of the Holy Spirit, that we may treasure in our hearts to really live it out by faith. And help, Lord Father, each one of us to teach someone the word of God that we understood, especially the parents, that they may teach their kids the way of the Lord. So, Lord, we lift all these things unto you, that we may worship you with our lives. And we pray all this in your precious name, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Good morning, Savior Community Church. Um, Let's come together and sing some songs. Uh, We want to enter the courts of the Lord with thanksgiving and praise. And uh, this is a special time where we corporately call upon his name and seek him. So let's uh, really, really join in um, together in singing these songs from our hearts and not just from our lips.
This is the reason I sing For the hope that you give And the joy that you bring For the promise that heaven is waiting for me This is the reason I sing for the hope that you give. The promise that heaven is waiting for me. This is the reason.
bring glory to your name. Born a babe, a virgin bird. My God, the high and lofty one, you came to earth to be a slave, servant of all. You washed my feet, you took my fall. Though you were rich, you became poor, that you that I might live. You poured out your soul even to death, taking my sin just to forgive me. Then they led you down the road. You took the nail in your hands and feet. You drank the cup of wrath that was deserved for me. Though you were rich, you became poor. That you would die, that I might live. Taking my sin just to forgive me. Laid in the ground, a stone cold to the wrath of God resting on you. You knew no sin. From the foundation you were the lamb who was slain Look from the grave you rose again You hold the keys of death and hell you conquered sin You pay my debt a costly price I know Yes, Jesus, as we sung, we just thank you for coming to the earth, that God became man and died on the cross for our sins, that we may, and resurrected, that we may be with you, Lord. 
we thank you for this truth. We thank you for your love, your great love for us and your faithfulness. Lord, give us the gift of faith to live in light of this truth and to love you, Lord, and to respond and give all our days for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Check one, two, three, four. Good morning, church. Welcome to Sunday service. It was great to worship. Thank you, band, for leading us. I'm very grateful for the gospel that we're reminded as we get to sing praise to God. Um, my name is John. I'm one of the elders here. I'd like to share a few announcements for us for this week. Uh, we are continuing with our midweek small groups. We call them discipleship groups. And so if you are interested in joining, we have um, multiple groups on different nights from Tuesdays through Fridays. And uh, more of the information is going to be on our website, savorycommunity.com. You can uh, ask me or a friend about which groups on which nights, and uh, we'd love to have you, right? So if you are even a visitor, it's open to everyone. We want to have a time of, of sharing of what God is doing in our lives, and we'll discuss a bit of, about the message, um, any prayer requests, things that we need accountability in. That's an opportunity for us to be the body together, Okay. Um, our next announcement is for our giving and offering. Um, we have two ways to give. One way is if you walked in, we have a little black box that says offering on it. The other way uh, is the online digital way of going to our website, and there's a, a link there that says give, and you can enter in that information there. Um, and our last announcement for today uh, is going to be for our food team. So every Sunday... Uh, we do serve lunch, and um, that is thanks to our food team. And uh, we want to kick off the year together, but we also want to make sure that we can be uh, continuing to offer lunch every week. And so we are looking for more members uh, who are interested in helping. Um, it really isn't this daunting thing. I know feeding like 90 to 100 people seems like a crazy thing, but I think we have it down to a very good operational science. And... Um, yeah, if you're interested, please come out on next Sunday at 4.30. It's going to be at Austin's house. Austin's dad is and, and mom is hosting uh, that time. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit about what this year looks like and how we can kind of fine-tune some things. And so if you are a food team member, please be there. Um, if you are a member and you're looking for new ways to serve, we are looking uh, to see if we can continue to serve lunch um, by having more members help us, okay? So... Uh, please talk, talk, talk to Michelle. Uh, she leads the food team. And then um, if you have any other details, um, we'll, we'll talk through that, okay? Um, I think that's it. I'm going to invite up Pastor Corey. He's going to preach the word for us today. Thank you, Jonathan. Well, it's nice to be back together with you after a two-week hiatus. I was sick the two weeks I was gone. So um, maybe being here is a good thing, huh? So we were watching our two of our grandkids. So I wasn't all that ill. So I was just still able to watch two of our grandkids with my wife. But it was a, it was good being back at SBCC, South Bay Community Church, for two weeks. But this is becoming our home away from home. This week my wife has, in, has to serve at SBCC, so she couldn't make it. But I think we're going to be here the next four weeks or three of the next four weeks. Now this morning I'll be sharing parenting principles from Proverbs. Now, some of you may be thinking, as you are sitting here, uh, I'm not a parent, all right? Well, you may be an uncle or an auntie, or soon to be. And so what I'm going to share today will be helpful for you as an uncle and auntie as you interface with your nieces and or nephews. Someday you may have children of your own, Lord willing, in which case uh, you can take the precepts of this message, the principles I'm going to teach you, and kind of tuck it away, or at least know that there are things in the scriptures that will help you raise your children. Uh, you were once a child, which meant you were raised in some fashion. And so you can kind of cross-reference what I'm going to be sharing from the scriptures today with the way in which you were raised, which may have impacted you one way or another. And it could give you some insights into that this morning. Fourthly, God is our heavenly parent. And so the things he teaches us about parenting are the principles and applications he uses in fathering us. 
And so it could be helpful in, this is, in the fact that this is the way God the Father parents us as our heavenly parent. But let me state at the outset of the message three really important things that I think parents need to do, know and to do. So uh, this is outside the context of the Proverbs. Number one, ask two people to pray for your children daily. Recruit two people that you believe are prayer warriors and say, you know, for as long as my children are in, our children are in our household, could you pray for them daily? Now, that doesn't mean you need to give them daily prayer requests, although today it's possible because of text messaging. But that puts, a, uh, I think, an inordinate burden upon them. Rather, just tell them every day as the Lord leads you by his Holy Spirit, pray for our kids or pray for the child you're assigned to. And then um, on special occasions or when there's a special prayer request, like, you know, our, uh, our son is thinking about what college to go to. Could you just pray that the Spirit of God would lead him in that? So you can give them special prayer requests. We had a couple when we first got to Evergreen, and the youngest was a baby. And their name was Henry and Itsuko Teragawa. And they were, I thought they were elderly at the time, but they were younger than I am today. And um, so we asked this couple, who were prayer warriors in the church, could you pray daily for our three daughters? So they took up the banner. And every day, Henry and Itsuko prayed for our three daughters. Well, Henry went home to be with the Lord, but Itsuko lived to be 104. And she just passed away two years ago. So, and she, when I visited, I was visiting her, and she was um, in hospice care at her house. And she had a picture of our daughters on the wall. And to the very end of her life, she prayed daily for my three daughters. So our daughters had a prayer warrior for them for over 40-something years of their lives. It started when they were little girls, and they prayed daily. So recruit two prayer warriors, or a prayer warrior, two for each child. And we had East Coast Henry pray for all three of ours. Right? They're very faithful. And they, we invited the family gathering, so they kind of kept abreast of our children as they were growing up. Number two, parents need to grow in Jesus themselves. Very important. Now, I'm going to get to this toward the end of the message, but you need to continue as a parent, as a person, to grow in Jesus because your children will mimic you, and they might as well mimic you mimicking Jesus as opposed to something else in the world. Number three, fathers or dads love your children's mother, and mothers love your children's father. One of the things that I think is really important is to make sure you have a strong marriage. Sometimes when you're in the hustle and bustle of raising kids, you forget about your marriage. And a lot of marriages grow cold when the, when, during the empty nest period of their lives because while they were raising their kids, their marriage grew cold. And so when the kids left the house, their marriage had not progressed to the point where they could endure post-children. So have your, uh, make sure you, you grow your marriage, be in a Bible study together or separately, worship together, pray together, uh, attend a marriage and re- enrichment weekend sometime during the course of your marriage, observe date nights. My wife and I are real good about that during the intensive years of our children. We, but we had grandparents around, so we'd drop the kids off, and once a week we would go out on a date night, kind of debrief of what's going on in our lives. And we also had one or two weekends together away during the year. Me being a pastor, that was really important. We go away for a weekend. And again, my parents or her parents would watch our children. Now let me share with you a couple of quotes from Neil Postman. And these are quotes I really like. Again, this is apart from the Proverbs. First quote. I love this quote. Children are the living messages we send to a time we will not see. That is so true. I kind of rephrase it. Children are a living message we send into a world that we will never see. That is really true with our grandkids. Again, we have 13 grandkids. They are approaching a world that my wife and I will never see. But we need to help prepare them for that world. Here's another quote from Neil Postman. I believe I am not mistaken in saying that Christianity is a demanding and serious religion. When it is... Delivered as easy and amusing, it is another kind of religion altogether. 
We have to make sure we teach our kids what the faith is really all about, especially the trials and tribulations that are associated with living in this world. Another quote, third quote, if parents wish to preserve childhood for their own children, they must conceive of parenting as an act of rebellion against culture. This is so true today, even more so maybe than when we're raising our kids, because culture is going upside down rapidly in our society today. Now, I'm going to share, I had two life verses in raising children. And I asked the Lord, okay, well, how am I supposed to be a dad? And he gave me two life verses in raising children. The first life verse is out of Proverbs 22.6. Train up a child in the way he should go, and even when he is old, he will not depart from it. That's the first verse. The second verse is out of Ephesians 6.4. And fathers, do not provoke your children to anger but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Right. So I'm going to take the first of the two and exposit that verse this morning. And that will teach us about parenting. Now, there are different ways of preaching and teaching the Word of God. There is verse-by-verse verse expository preaching. Expository means you are, you are telling people what the word, that Word of God says. You start with the Word of God and then you talk about what it applies to. Thematic expository preaching takes a theme of the Bible, like the kingdom of God, and you preach the theme from the scriptures. Expository means it comes out of the scriptures. Narrative expository preaching is you preach in a story form. It's not used that often, but it's a form of preaching. A fourth way is topical expository preaching. Note all four are expository, meaning they come from the scriptures. You take a topic and exposit the text about the topic, like parenting. Now, there are some schools of thought that say, well, you should only do verse-by-verse -verse expository preaching without illustrations, without applications, without stories. Right. So when I first started as a preacher, some guys that I knew that were in seminary, and I wasn't in seminary yet, and I told you that story early on, uh, said, oh, well, you're a storyteller right, as a preacher. And I wasn't sure if that was a compliment or not. So I decided, well, how am I, does God want me to preach and teach his word? Is it okay to be a storyteller? So what I did was, I decided instead of going to resource books, I would go to the resource book. And so I opened up Matthew, and I read through the greatest sermon ever preached. Jesus' sermon, Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5 through 7. And so I read through a sermon multiple times, and I came to a conclusion. Jesus was a storyteller. Think about, read Matthew 5, 6, and 7. He was a storyteller. He gave illustrations, and he gave applications. And then you look at his parables throughout his teaching. They're all stories. So I thought, okay, if it's good enough for Jesus to teach and preach that way from the scriptures, then it must be okay. And so that's the way I tend to preach. Now I'm going to do a different form of expository preaching this morning. It's not going to be verse by verse. It's going to be word by word. So I'm going to do a word by word expository message out of Proverbs 22, verse 6. And this is the way it's going to sound. All right. All right. Uh, four ways of raising a child. So this is the preface. Four ways of raising a child. You raise them by chance. You raise them by chance. You fly by the seat of your pants. Ever heard of that expression? Remember, I'm older than you, so you're going to hear idioms and adages that are from my generation and era, and I'm not going to explain them all. But flying by the seat of your pants means you just sort of make it up as you go along. No plans. Proverbs 21, 5, 5 says this. This is one of my favorite verses. No, it's about stewardship, but there's a principle within it. The plans of the diligent lead surely to advantage, but everyone who is tasty comes surely to poverty. So it's about stewardship, all right? But what's the, what's the principle? You need to plan. Plans are good. You don't, need, don't be stuck on your plans, but be sure to plan because they lead to what? Advantage. Whereas if you're hasty, mean, meaning you fly by the seat of your pants, it, it could lead to something let, called poverty in the stewardship world. So raising your children by chance is the same as being hasty with no plan. So if you're a parent right now, do you have some sort of plan? Third, second way is raise them the way you were raised. I think this is the default way people raise their kids. 
according to the way you were raised. You liked the way you were raised, so you raised your children the way you were raised. Same kind of ground rules, same kind of things that go on in your family now went on in your previous family. And this sometimes causes conflict with, with, with couples. Or you didn't like the way you were raised, so you want to raise them differently than the way you were raised. Both are defaults to the way you were once raised. Neither one of them could maybe a good plan. Third way, raise them according to worldly guidelines. What does the world say? There's all kinds of books out there. When, I, when we were raising our kids, the premier expert in the field was named Dr. Benjamin Spock. Ever heard of that? This is not the Star Trek guy. Dr. Benjamin Spock, he was a, I think he was a pediatrician. He wrote a very influential book uh, about parenting. The two most bought books during that period were the Bible number one and Dr. Benjamin Spock's book number two, as there was a generation of boomers who were going to raise their kids. He advocated that parents were supposed to let their kids be kids. Now, some of the things he said I thought were pretty good, but basically what resulted is parents, the parents we knew that raised their kids according to the, that book, were permissive. They just let their kids do what they want with no parameters and no boundaries. Right? I don't know if that was Spock's intention, but that was the result in the, kid, in the parents we saw that referred to his book, or his worldly book. Later on, like 30 years later, he recanted a portion of his book. See, you never have to recant what's in the scriptures because it's always relevant. It's the word of God. The grass fades, the flower fades, and the grass withers, but the word of God stands forever, the Bible says. Well, Sp Spock was quoted as saying, these parents raised a generation of brats. This is what transpired. No boundaries, no discipline, nothing. Just let them be who they want to be. Or, fourthly, raise them according to biblical guidelines. The Bible is replete with the principles necessary to raise children. You just have to open the book and figure out where it is. Right. So I'm going to help you this morning a little bit. All right, Proverbs. Parenting principles from Proverbs 22, verse 6. A word-by-word a word -word exposition. Train up a child in the way he should go. Even when he is old, he will not depart from it. It's one of the most, two most influential verses in my parenting of our three daughters. And it describes a plan for parenting. Now, this isn't all of what the Bible teaches, but this is a good starting point. Train up. See, train up a child in the way they should go. Okay, the first two words are, our first word is really train up. The word train up means the palate, the roof of the gum, or the roof of the mouth, or the gum area. That's what the word palate means. The verb form was used in that day to describe a wild horse being tamed by putting a bit in its mouth or putting a rope in its mouth. And that's how you would tame, one of the ways in which you would tame a wild horse, a wild stallion. The verb was also used in Solomon's day to describe the actions of a midwife. You know what a midwife is? A person who helps deliver the child into the world and then helps the mother learn how to take care of a child. Well, the midwife would take her finger and dip it into some crushed sweet grapes. Right? She'd dip it in there, and then she'd rub it on the gums and the palate of the, of the infant, of the newborn, to develop a sucking sensation in the child. So they were training up a child to take mommy's milk by, by um, coating the roof and the gums with, with, um, with grapes, sweet grape. It meant to develop a thirst in the child for that which was good, mommy's milk. Therefore, training in this verse means Taming something that is wild, and we are all born children of what, according to the Bible? Children of wrath. Every child, child, don't they seem perfect and without sin when you, they first come out of the womb? It doesn't take very long for them to be who they are. What, is, what does God say in, the, in Romans? Paul wrote, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And you, you can see how selfish a child is as they develop. It's not a bad thing. It's just who a child is. Mom and daddy have to provide everything. But you will begin to see disobedience rise in your children. It's just going to happen as lovely as they are when they are first born. And 
our responsibility of parents is to help tame them, keep them from running wild. And we need to help them develop a taste for that which is good for them. And what's the best for your children? The Word of God. Developing a taste for spiritual things that belong to Jesus. You know, one of the things um, we, we went, when I was taking care of our, our granddaughters, we went and got some Mexican food. And by the way, our two little granddaughters are, are adopted through the foster care program. They're both Hispanic. All right, so we got some Mexican food. And I was talking to the people that I was with, like, and my, my wife being one of them, but she's heard this before from me. I, I don't understand how little Hispanic kids can eat spicy foods. You know, I mean, I can't eat uh, extremely spicy food, but we used to have a store. My family had a store in East Los Angeles in the barrio. And um, little kids would come up, and they'd be chunking on, chewing on a jalapeno. I mean, how can this little child eat a jalapeno pepper? Right? It just, it was beyond me because no one can possibly like a jalapeno the first time you put it in your mouth, right? But w- what causes a little Hispanic child to grow up eating spicy foods at a fairly young age? Well, a couple things. The Bible talks about mimicking parents. Paul says one in, in 1 Corinthians 11, when I'll refer to this later, mimic me because I mimic Jesus. Kids mimic their parents. So when daddy eats hot stuff, Son wants to eat hot stuff. That's part of it. But the second thing is they give them jalapeno lollipops. You ever seen these at the store? There's a whole cottage industry regarding this confection. There's a whole host of childhood children confectionery uh, products that are hot, spicy. Here's a picture of one of them. All right. That's, That's jalapeno candy, and it's spicy. This habanero, I think that was a little spicier. And little kids eat these. Why? To develop a taste for spicy stuff. And as a Christian parent, we're supposed to develop a taste in our children for the things of God. Is that what we're doing? That's what we're called to do by God. So in Proverbs, there's this idea of taming children and developing a taste for a godly, righteous life. We're we're doing that anyway with our children. Moms, when you dress your daughters up in the latest little fashions, what are you developing a taste in them for? Little wonder later on, they want to dress fashionably. Dad, you watch football. Going to watch the Green Bay Packers today, right? I'm recording it. We watch football. In fact, um, the two little ones were sitting next to me, and they wanted to watch something on Netflix, a child's program. And I said, how about watching football? I didn't want to do that. But if I had them sit there every day, every Sunday, and watch a little football with me, they might grow a taste for football. I doubt it. But my wife is trying to. She's trying her best. <laughs> Over, um, in the mornings, when they were staying at our house, they stayed for about eight days at our house, and I went to their house to take care of them at their house before mom came home from Japan. And um, every morning they'd get up, and the first thing we allowed, my wife allowed them to do was sit on our bed, and we have a little TV in our bed, really more like a monitor, and a VHS machine. You know what that is, VHS? Because some of the videos we use for our children, and we are now using for our grandchildren, and we don't know how to get these videos anymore because they're Christian videos. So every morning they get up, and we, they could stick it before we give them breakfast, while we're making breakfast, they could stick a VHS in there, and they know how to do it now. They stick a VHS in there, and they watch, like, I think they, their favorite is Daniel in the Lion's Den. Or the Cedarmon Kids Action Bible Store songs. You ever heard of these? That's okay, these are old. But uh, I, I, with my um, older grandchildren, we used uh, VeggieTales. Right. So in the morning, when the, well, the first thing we wanted them to see were things of the Lord, to tame them, because it would quiet them down and tra- to, to help develop a taste of the things of God in their lives. Isaiah 5, 4, A says this, He awakens me morning by morning. He awakens my ear to listen as a disciple. So, God awakens us from slumber, and then he awakens our heart to listen to him as a disciple. 
And that's what we try to do with our little ones. We awaken them from slumber because we want them to get up promptly because they have to for school and then awaken their souls with the things of God. And so sometimes parents, we need to be intentional on how we raise our children in the Lord. And thank God for videos. Yeah. Uh, I have all these books that I bought. For, I can't even buy these anymore. I can't find them online. But uh, I would read stories out of books. And the other thing I would do with my children was I'd get puppets. You know, the hand puppets. I had like about five or six hand puppets. And I would use different voices. And I would teach them Bible stories and teach them stories using puppets. I'd make up stories. Christian stories. You know, with a Bible intention, a, a, a Bible verse intentionality behind it. And it's amazing how children will listen to a puppet over a person. I mean, if, you, if I told the story, they, I can't hold their attention. If I use the puppet, they're rivet on the puppet. My mouth could be moving like crazy. It didn't matter. That voice was coming out of the puppet. And those are devices you can use to raise your children in the Lord, to hold their attention and feed them the things of God. That verse goes on to say, a child, a child. Now, in your mind, think about, well, what does that mean to you, a child? Got it? In 1 Samuel 4.21, it refers to a newborn infant. In 1 Samuel 1.27, it refers to a young boy who has been weaned, so no longer an infant. In Genesis 21.16, it refers to Ishmael in his pre-teen years, right? so 12 and under. In Genesis 37, 2, it refers to Joseph at the age of 17. In Genesis 34, 19, it refers to a young man ready for marriage. So the word child basically could mean a child of a, of a parent who's still in the household and under the authority of their parents. So you could be 23 years old and still a child in some respects, but parents do not treat your 23-year-old as a child, all right? But the principles here still apply to someone who may be in their 20s if they still live at home and are not married. Hence, a child can be at any age prior to leaving the household, and it could be a, a mature adult. Therefore, we have parental responsibilities for a 23-year-old to a 24-year-old still living under our roof. And when they, when they reach the um, teen years, so this is... This is a tough transition for parents. You're raising your child when they're small. You keep raising them, certain, using certain methods. You keep raising them. All of a sudden, they're teenagers. If you're still treating your teenager the way you treated your five-year-old, you're going to be in for a rude awakening and a tough time. It doesn't work. Right? But you have a responsibility for the teenager because they're still your child from this biblical perspective. So what needs to happen, and this is a hard transition, I think especially for moms, right, because moms are probably with the child a little bit more than dads, even in this day and age. So as they grow up, you begin to transform how you parent them. And by the time they're high schoolers, you need to be their mentors, not their authoritarian. That's the goal. You want to get from being you know, when your children are small, you're like God to them. You provide everything for them. But as they grow up, they realize you're not God. <laughs> you have error and problems in your life. You're a sinner. And high schoolers can point out their parents' sin ever so, ever so rapidly and well. Correct? You know what your problems your parents have now. Well, my goal was, okay, I need to progress as a parent. So by the time they're teenagers, I become their mentor and they come to me for advice. So I'm no longer commanding them. I'm giving them counsel, godly counsel, on how to deal with the problems of life. So a child is a child, really until you leave the household. I don't think this intends to a 45-year-old person still living at home. But by and large, people could be in their 20s and still a child. And by the way, if you are in your 20s and you're still living at home, if I would have lived at my house with my parents until I got married. Even if I was like, even if I were like 30, I'd probably still live at home because I, I love my mother's cooking, right? So if, you're, if, if you are older, 
and you're in your household, ask your parents, what are the house rules? And all I asked of my daughters when they hit their, when they graduated college and they still lived at home for a bit, these are the house rules, abide in these. This is where they were able to show obedience to their, for their, to their parents. Other than that, I mean, they were adults. I did have them pay rent the moment they started working. It wasn't a whole lot, but I had them pay rent. Now, this was my plan. I got rent from them, and I put it away in an account for their weddings. All right? So whatever they paid me, they were going to get back. I didn't tell them this. Whatever they pay me, they're going to get back in their wedding. The problem was they got married within a year. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't get to say very much for their wedding. My wife and I got married when we were 21. My daughters were all pre-24 when they got married, which is unusual, even back then. All right? But they got married right away, and, I, and we had two weddings in a six-month period, right after they graduated from my, one right after uh, grad school. Well, both right after grad school. They got married, so they were already like 23. All right. Where was I? Oh, yeah. <laughs> you, want to, you want to transition into mentorship. All right. The next word is what? In. In. It's a little, little, little vert word. Huh? In. Now, the word in means in keeping with, in cooperation with, or in accordance to. Now, I prefer in cooperation with. As how I'll define this particular word, in. You see, we are supposed to, as parents, cooperate with God in the raising of our children. It's not just our plan for our kids. It's God's plan. What do you want in your own life as an adult? Don't you want to do God's plan? You want to cooperate with God's plan as an individual for your own life. Well, so as parents, we should want to cooperate with God for his plan for our children. And in our case now with my wife and I, for our grandchildren. Now, in the Asian American community, Almost every parent has a particular plan for their newborn. Go to college. All right. How many of you are planning for your child, if you have children, to go to college? Just raise your hand. Right. I did. We started a college fund when they were born. Going to college. That is part of the Asian American community. Now the question then becomes, what college? It, it is amazing what juniors and seniors go through to get into the college of their choice. They'll have top three, top two, sometimes have a top one. Ivy League schools, Stanford, maybe UCLA, USC. You have a plan. If you're a USC grad, you want your child to go to USC, that's your plan from the time they're born. So what do you do? You buy them clothing that has USC on it. As somehow that's going to influence them. All right. <clears throat> It was predicted by 2025, just a few years from now, just a couple of years from now, between 20, 2025 and maybe 2030, you know, college admission is going to drop like 40%. Kids are going to stop going to college. Kids who are normally be college bound aren't going to go to college. I know this because I'm, I'm a trustee at Maranatha High School. I think I shared that with you before. And we're, we're projecting that because we're a college preparatory school, a Christian, a Christ-centered evangelical college preparatory school. And we have to prepare for the day when kids won't be preparing for college anymore. And I think there's still going to be a population that wants to. That's 60%. But 40% are going to drop out in college. And that may be your child 15 years from now, 20 years from now. College is not going to be the thing that kids will want to do. Remember, through it all, God has a plan. Now, as a trustee at Maranatha, when I first got there, I had, a goal, one, I had a, several goals. One goal was to convince the student population, to convince their parents, and to convince our faculty and staff that the most important place for your child to be is in the center of God's will. And it may not be Harvard. It may not be a four-year university. It may be a community college. It may be a trade school. It may be a gap year. It may be culinary school. Perish the thought if your child goes to culinary school. But what if that's God's design for your child? We need to conform our will to God's will. And so finally, after five years, I think the school is pretty much bought into it. The best college for your child to be in is the one God wants your child to be in. And that's the philosophy you need to embrace, and that's what you need to communicate to your parents, to your children. The best place to be, like, 
Heaven forbid, what if they go to missions in Africa? As devout as you are, that may not be what you desire for your child. But you know where the safest place for your child is? In the center of God's will, not in the center of our will. God's will be done, not our will be done. Remember, God has a plan for your child. He has a destiny for your child, and we need to cooperate with God regarding that. Next it says the way. Train up a child in the way they should go. Way means characteristic, manner, or mode. That's what a way means. Characteristic, manner, or most people understand the way, the way you're supposed to go, a way you're supposed to go. So what does it mean? Well, it's this word is nonspecific in nature in the Hebrew language. Nonspecific way. That means there's more than one way. Now let me give you two examples of a specific way. The way to the wizard is via what? In the Wizard of Oz. The yellow brick road, right? The only way to get to the wizard is follow the yellow brick road. That is a specific way. Jesus said in John chapter 14, verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. There's only one way to salvation. There's only one way to heaven. There's only one way to get your sins forgiven, and that's through Jesus. There is no other way. Very specific. That's not the word that's used here in Proverbs. It's non-specific. Let me give you an example. Proverbs 30, verses 18 and 19 says this. There are three things that are too wonderful for me, four which I do not understand. The way of an eagle in the sky, the way of a serpent on the rock, the way of a ship in the middle of the sea, and the way of a man with a maid. Right? Those are all non So the way of an eagle is different than the way of a serpent. Eagles in the air, serpents crawl along the ground. Two non-specific ways, each specific to that particular creature. The word that's used in this proverb is non-specific. What does that mean? That means every child has a way about them. When you were growing up, you were if you had a brother or and or sister, you were different than your brother and sister, correct? Because you each had a specific way about you. But it's not specific to each person. In other words, your way is different than your brother or different than your sister. Everybody in this room has, a, has different ways about them, specific to you, but not to anybody else necessarily. Every child is unique. They are a raw bundle of, of, of material that's going to be molded to a particular way by you and by the Lord. And hopefully you're cooperating with the Lord. My brother and I were different. I was academic, more academic. Right. So I got I got pretty good grades. My brother was not academic. Right. But he was really good with his hands. On Christmas, we just celebrate Christmas, we get a toy. I get a toy. I'm sort of OCD. So I keep it wrapped up. I didn't want to dirty my toy. Strange child. I was now strange when I was growing up. My wife will say I'm strange now, but I was strange when I was growing up. I mean, I, I, I wouldn't open that toy because I didn't want to dirty it. So I kept it in this box. My brother, on the other hand, took his toy. On the first day, he would take it apart because he wanted to see how it worked. That was his way. My way was keep it in the box. Don't use it. My brother was, let's open up, take it apart, and see how it works. He became a mechanic. Really good. Had a great career. Is one way better than the other? No. We each had a way. And God, my parents weren't believers, but they did one thing really, really well with us. They let me go my way, and they let my brother and supported him in his way. And I, I think that was a really smart decision on the parents. But a lot of times parents want their child to all be this. They want cookie-cutter kids. Right? But my kids were wild. I, st I still have one of my toys that I got when I was you know, a Shuko racer. You wind it up, it still works because I kept it in a box for years. I got to find it. It's not the way in a box, but I still have it. And it still works. My brother took his apart. But, when, but then he became an auto mechanic. All right. Here's two principles to remember. Two principles to remember. I'm going longer than I normally go, but 
I have fun with this. Two principles to remember. Principle number one, you can't use the identical approach with each child. That makes sense, right? You can't treat your children the same. My Tiffany, the oldest, was the most cognitive, so we had to reason with her rationally. Second child, Sunday, was the most relational, so we had to feel what she felt and deal with her feelings. You know, seek first to understand before being understood. Our last daughter was the most insightful, so we couldn't be superficial with her. And she figured it out right away. Each were different, and we had to treat them differently. On their birthdays, I take my daughters. That's something you might want to think of to do, dads. On my birthdays, from the time they were five, I took each one of my daughters out by themselves for their birthday dinner, daddy and me time. Uh, Tiffany, had, she got dressed up in a real nice Easter dress, and I took her to, to um, took her Charlie Brown's. Anybody know what Charlie Brown's is? It was a rib house. Nice, nice. And we got done, and I said, well, how'd you like it? I'd rather go to McDonald's, Daddy. All right, there you go. We just spent all that money, and we could have gone to McDonald's. All right, Tiffany, when she got older, liked beautiful restaurants. So I always chose restaurants with ambiance. Her favorite restaurant was called The Room at the Top. In the middle of L- it was one of the tallest buildings in L.A., and you had a panoramic view of the city of Los Angeles. The food was good. I had a Japanese chef at the time, so I got Japanese sticky rice for dinner that was not on the menu. It was his sticky rice that he would eat. So we went there, and we, I picked nothing but beautiful restaurants. My middle daughter loved fellowship. So we went to, like, not so beautiful restaurants necessarily, but every once in a while she could take one or two friends with us because that was important to her. The third daughter loved steaks. So she and I went to every great steakhouse in Southern California. She's my favorite daughter. <laughs> right? I tell that to them, I go, oh, see, Bethany was my favorite. She likes steak. So you have, to, my mother used to always say, I treat everyone equal. She didn't. You know, she didn't. She said that with the grandkids. I treat all the grandchildren the same. I said, Mom, you don't have to treat them all the same because they are all different. But that was the mantra of Nisei moms. We treat all our kids the same. That is not the raise ki- way to raise kids. Because they're different. They're nonspecific to the other children. Principle number two, you shouldn't negatively compare one child with the other. Don't compare your children all the time. For instance, when you do when you evaluate report cards, do it individually and privately with each child, especially if there's disparity in the report cards. You don't ever want to compare one child to another because they're different. It's, it's an it's a, uh, exercise in futility to compare them because they're different. I had two friends, adults, got to know them when they were adults, good guys, good friends, played ball with both of them, right? separately, but both of them. They both had struggles in certain areas, very similar struggles. I, they told me their story. They each had an older brother. Each older brother died before they hit the age of 22. 23. One was in the military, the other was an auto accident. So the older brother died. The mothers, separate mothers, said the same thing to these two friends of mine repeatedly. They say when she would, when they got mad, the wrong son died. And they both told their boys, you're not going to grow up to amount to anything. They told me, I, I couldn't believe what I heard. They both said the same thing about what their mother said and they both had similar life, life stories. They got divorced, and they were pretty good dads. But it was, it was they just had, they had problems in the same area of life, these two friends of mine. That's a comparison that was horrendous, isn't it? I mean, you, you sit there, and you know that was not a good comparison. But how often do we compare our kids in other ways that don't seem as bad, but can impact the child negatively? Don't compare your children one to another. Oh, she is good. I mean, she sits there quietly. The other children running around. Why can't you sit quietly like someone's, like your other child? Well, this other child's built differently. They need to run around. That's the way they learn. That's the way they exhaust energy. The other one's sitting there and using their brain. They're different. So we'll treat them differently. Then it says, should go. Train up a child in the way they should go. The way... Uh, it's related to the word way. It's how a child lives their life. 
here's, here's an insight for living. God has a destiny for every child. He has, he has a way they should go. And parents need to discover the way they should go. And sometimes it takes a long time. Some kids don't begin to, to realize their destiny until they're much older. So don't fret if they don't have their life solidly planned by the age 18. It may take a while. Old, they should go. Old, word means hair on the chin. It's not just the idea of an old man or old woman, but a mature adult. That's what the word old means. So much of your training of your children in the way they should go will bear fruit when they're older, when they're more mature. You may not see a whole lot of fruit early on, but pray that you'll see it further and farther down the road. Fruits of your labors will not be immediate. Could be. Praise the Lord if it is. But what you really want is your, the things you sow in your child, they will reap when they get older. It says he will not depart from it. They will learn, they will live as they learn and learn as they live. How can you assess your child? Proverbs 20, 11 and 12 says, It is by his deeds that a dad distinguishes himself if his conduct is pure and right. The hearing, of ear, the hearing ear and the seeing eye, the Lord has made them both. You'll just know by their deeds how a lad distinguishes himself or a, a girl distinguishes himself. You may be deal with your child early and they're angels, right? Perfect angels. When puberty hits, something happens. A switch goes off, and they change. Boys will become sullen. By the way, when your son stops talking to you because they're now a teenager, whenever they want to talk, drop everything and listen. Don't say much. Listen. Every once in a while, a teenage boy will want to talk. Let them talk. Drop everything. Turn off the football game. Drop everything and listen to them. And take advantage of that moment in time. Some parents get us discouraged because they're not doing well. They may even leave the faith. Um, sometimes kids wander. Right? We, had a, we had a kid in our youth group way back in the day. We were at Rosemead at the time. And before we hived. And he was uh, a challenge. All right? this, this, young youth person, this young person in the youth group. We finally had to kick him out of the youth group. He planted marijuana in the property of the church. Not the brightest thing to do if you're a part of the youth group. And he was trying to introduce drugs into the lives of some of our kids. As a pastor, your job is to protect the flock. So we said, you can no longer be a part of our youth group. But we had our youth pastor walk with him after we kicked him out. We had to discipline him. So he said, you can't come to youth group, but we'll still meet with you. Post high school, he was a football player in our post high school. Something happened in his life. He came back to the church, sought out our youth pastor, and he made a confession of faith in Jesus. It took a while, and he was not a good student. He's now a pastor. No marijuana on his church property. And he is really, really smart. He does his sermons in, the, in Greek and Hebrew. I mean, he is just really uh, intellectually powerful in the Word of God. Nothing like the way he was in high school and college even. What happened? Well, we tried to train him up in the way he should go, and he returned to it as an adult and really solid in the Lord. He just kind of left his church, and he's semi-retired now, semi-retired. I think he's still going to do the work of the Lord, but semi-retired. He matured beautifully. And his mother was worried about him early on. And now, you know, blessed. She was blessed toward the end of her life. We have to have confidence in the fact that when we train up a child in the way they should go, it will influence them later in life. So never lose heart. Never lose heart. All right, a couple of ending notes. Roman numeral three was, God loves your child more than you do. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. That's how much God loves us. That's how much God loves your child. He loves your child more than you do. Can you believe that? It's hard to believe because you love your child so much. You know, your parents felt that way about you when you were born, as you were growing up, no matter what transpired in the later years. 
They had that same kind of loving devotion toward you. God loves your child and children more than you love them. And that will release you as a parent to be free to do the things parents need to do. God loves your child more than you do. I could not fathom that. I can't fathom that with my grandkids, but I know it's true. So I trust the Lord for my children, and I trust the Lord for my grandkids. And then finally, changed lives changes lives. What do I mean by that? Philippians 3, 7 says, Brethren, join in the following my example and observe those who walk according to the pattern you have in us. Paul says this multiple times. Imitate me because I imitate Jesus. We give you the pattern of life. What does that mean? That means your life needs to change more to be like Jesus every day that you live so that your child will mimic that and not the person you don't want your child to mimic. Are you growing in Jesus? First Corinthians 4, 14 to 16 says, I do not write these things to shame you, but to admonish you as my beloved children. That's Paul's relationship with the church. I'm your father, you're my children. For you, if you were have, have countless tutors in Christ, yet you would not have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I became your father through the gospel. I exhort you, therefore, be imitators of me. That's the second time he says it in Corinthians. Later on, he says in 1 Corinthians 11, imitate me. He uses the parent-child relationship, asking his children to imitate him. That is what kids are going to do, without question. You know what's interesting? As a pastor of church, you watch a father's son, the son's now in high school, maybe college. You see them walking in, they walk alike. You ever notice that? They're so It's kind of, they weren't that way when the kid was small, but when he gets older, he becomes like his father. And they begin to adopt speech patterns and things like their dad because kids mimic adults. You need to know that, and you need to live your life accordingly. They mimic adults, your, their parents. So let's uh, say you're sitting in church today, whenever, and on the way home you eat, you're eating, uh, your kids are a little bit older, and you're eating lunch, and then you complain about the sermon. You complain about the pastor. You complain about the church. Your child becomes an 18-year-old, doesn't want to be part of the church anymore. Can you blame them? Because all they've been hearing every lunch after dinner is, or after church is, negative things about the church. Now, it doesn't mean there aren't negative things about any church, because there are. Don't focus on them in the presence of your children. Affirm the good things that happen in church and with your pastors and with the message. Don't critique the message in front of your children, even though we make mistakes, even though there are times it's not that good, maybe. Affirm the things of value from every sermon, because every sermon has something of value. Affirm that in the presence of your children, that they may be nurtured and trained up in the way of righteousness to look for the things that are good and not always for the things that are negative, because they're going to mimic you. As sure as shooting, they will mimic you. By the way, those of you who are single and may someday, the Lord may bring it, when you're with your significant other, the one you think you're going to marry, don't crumb on your parents all the time. Right? I know sometimes they're your sounding board. Oh, my mom, you know what mom did? You know what? My father. Right? So that's all they hear about your parents. All the negatives. Because you want to unload that stuff. So you get married. Let's go to mom and dad's house. I don't want to go there. Why? Maybe all they've been hearing is negative stuff about your mom and dad. Why should they want to go there? And then, and then people lament, why did I say all those things about my mom and dad? Your mom and dad have a lot of positive things about them. Share that with them, too. By the way, I've, I've seen this happen multiple times over 42 years of ministry. We need to be affirming people. You know, we need, we need, to, we need to look at the positive no, without ignoring the negatives. There's ways of dealing with the negative. Man, we need to be more positive and negative, especially as we raise our kids. 1 Timothy 1.5 says, For I am mindful of a sincere faith within you, which first dwelt in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and I am sure it is in you as well. What is he saying there? Well, the word sincere is, is the word from which you get hypocritical or unhypocritical. Mother and grandma were not hypocrites. What they taught is what they live. I share with you about PKs. One of the methods, that was my greatest fear. My, parent, my kids would be PKs. I don't remember if I shared with you, but I'm going to share it again. 
I think the issue was, this is what the Lord revealed to me as a pastor, to allay my fears. The problems PKs have is that when daddy preaches this message X and then he lives, he lives, doesn't live message X in, his, in the household. That his public life is not the same as his private life. Same with missionaries. Same with anybody in full-time Christian work. What you present on Sundays needs to be there on, at home. And that's called integrity, right? Your public life is the same as your private life. And that's the definition of character. Character is who you are inside. Reputation is who people think you are. And so, again, why? Because ch children will take their cues from you. If you're a hypocrite, why should they become a Christian? In fact, anybody in your life, if you want them to meet your Redeemer, you need to display a redeemed life. Doesn't that make sense? And such is the way of raising kids. So where are you in your faith? Are you growing? Have you ever confessed Jesus as Savior and Lord? Because that's the first step. If, you're, if you already know Christ, you need to be growing. If you don't know Jesus, the first step is to come to know him. To raise kids the way God wants your child to be raised. So I'm going to conclude the message by giving you an opportunity to pray. You can invite Christ into your life. That'll be the first opportunity. The second opportunity is you're already a believer. And man, you want to grow deeper in Christ so that you could be the kind of parent your kids deserve. Okay? So let's pray. First, if you've never asked Jesus to be your Savior and Lord, I would like to invite you to do that this morning. If you're not sure, invite him into your life. He'll answer this prayer. I'm going to say a prayer. You repeat it after me, making it your own, and God will honor it. This is the prayer to repeat. Dear Jesus, I believe you are God's son, that you died on the cross, that you rose from the grave. I am a sinner. Forgive me of my sins. I ask you into my life as my Savior and Lord. Now close off the prayer with an amen. And now for those of you who already know Jesus and you'd like to grow more in Christ so that you can be the best possible parent that you could be, would you repeat this prayer after me? Dear Lord, I haven't been walking with you as closely as I could. Today I commit myself fully to you. Help me. I won't be perfect, but I want to be more like Jesus. So this, this day, Lord, I commit myself to grow incrementally every day for the rest of my life. Help me with that, because I cannot do it on my own. Close off your prayer with an amen. And either prayer, first time confession, share it with somebody in the church family here. If you prayed a prayer that you'd like to rededicate yourself to be more like Jesus, share it with your spouse. Lord Jesus, we thank you and we praise you this day in your name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Lloyd. Uh, can we all stand? Sometimes I feel that if we want to grow in Jesus, we can sing songs that um, express our love for him. And so I have, um, and, and to glorify him. So I have a few songs that I like to sing to uh, glorify Jesus. Come, you weary heart, now to Jesus. Come, you anxious soul, now and see. There is perfect love and comfort in your tears. Rest here in his wondrous peace. Oh, the goodness. The goodness of Jesus satisfied 
This world cannot offer. Come and find your joy here, complete. Taste the living water and never thirst again. Rest here in his wondrous peace. Oh, the goodness, the goodness. Of Jesus, satisfy He is all that I need. Oh, may it become one day that I rest all my days in the goodness of Jesus. Oh, come and Find your hope now in Jesus. He is all he said he would be. Grace is overflowing from the Savior's heart. was my cross you bore so I could live in your freedom you died for and now my life is yours and I will sing of your goodness forevermore
grace goes on and on and I will sing of your goodness forevermore worthy is your name Jesus we deserve the praise worthy is your name worthy Lord, we thank you for your word. It is perfect. It teaches us, God, of how to live um, in obedience and in wisdom. And God, we thank you that you even in your grace know uh, that we need wisdom and how to parent, how to raise children, God, in your ways. And um, God, more than just being uh, in that life stage, Lord, uh, we, we thank you that part of your plan is to be our Father, our perfect and heavenly Father, to bring us into your family, to adopt us and to call us your sons and daughters. And that is a gift and blessing, God, that we must thank you for and continue to live, God, in gratitude. And so as we, as a church, God, have parents here, God, and pray, God, it would be, it would be a entire congregation's conviction, Lord, that we would choose uh, to follow your ways and not just uh, the wisdom that we, we hear from the world, things that, God, we have been trained in as we have lived our own lives and been raised a certain way, God, but really to surrender and to live according to your will. And so help us to see that in your word. Help us to repent and to cry out for mercy uh, with, the, with the challenges, God, of parenting over the years. And ultimately, God, that we would be imitators of you as we do that, God. We know that our children will imitate us. May that be so, God, in the family, but also just in this church. Bless us in that way. God, you are worthy of how we raise our kids and we pray that our kids would say that you are worthy of their worship. And may that be our aim, Lord, is that we would raise the next generation to say that you are worthy. And that is our, our calling, that is the command, and that is uh, what will glorify you. And that is our heart. 
So help us, God. We need it. We need your grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, everyone. Uh, it's great to worship with everyone here, and we'd like to do a benediction. Yeah. Next week, am I on? Next week, I'm going to do a two-part series. So it'll be part one of a two-part series. It'd be a good service to invite your friends to. I'll be uh, recommending a journey that you take that I think everyone should really take regarding a family relationship. Okay, so I'll, I'll do that next week and the week thereafter. So be thinking about it. So let's all rise together again. Let me render a benediction over you. The Lord bless you and the Lord keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you joy, peace, happiness, and holiness all the days of your lives. Amen and amen. Um, once we start setting up, if you want to stay in here to pray, you're welcome to stay here to reflect. God bless you guys.